faith. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I was speaking to someone not long ago about this verse, and I said, you know, it's remarkable. I wonder if people have read maybe John 9 as well as the first nine verses of John 10, and they have some inkling of an idea of what Jesus said there. But what will the proof deck, proof text syndrome do to you? It won't teach you John 9 or John 10. It'll teach you only John 10, 10. You won't know anything else. And so you won't know that the thief he's talking about would be religious leaders. Amen. That's what all of nine is talking about. Remember, he has this whole problem with the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. And because that he heals this man, and this man responds and believes, verse 38 of the preceding chapter, then Jesus goes on to give this little teaching beginning with the first verse of chapter 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Amen. Who's a thief and a robber? Well, you interpret that in light of John 9. You know, he's talking about Pharisees, scribes, lawyers, Sadducees, religious leaders today. You'll find out from various teachings, such as the quotations in the New Testament of Psalm 110, that Jesus' chief enemies are religious leaders. Of course, we recognize they're inspired by Satan, but they're the ones who come and teach us all that deception that some of us used to believe at one time. So the thief, that's not the devil. If you want to make the thief the devil, go find the passage that calls the devil the thief. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Well, does that mean poverty? Does that mean poverty and sickness? No, he's talking about they steal the truth away from you, the light of the revealed will of God, as it was written by the Old Testament prophets. And I've come that you can have life, that is, the truth, which will give you abundant life, and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, that makes a lot more sense to me. The other way sounds cuter, I Recognize that, but you can't always be cute and be in line with the Word of God. Many times just to do that will prove that you're not in line with the Word of God. So the question is, hath God written? All these things that people have made favorite verses of, hath God written that? Well, of course, you've got to do a little study about that. And, of course, a lot of times, although textual criticism might prove that the verse is valid, it's their interpretation that's invalid. They found that verse they wanted, John 10.10. 10. That's all right as far as the Greek manuscripts are concerned. But we're not talking about Greek manuscripts, rather charismatic interpretation of John 10 and verse 10. And you can really go to things like 1 Peter 2.24 and others and maybe learn some things that charismatics don't know. You know, many times you won't be able to see the forest because of the trees. You've looked at that verse so many times that all you can think of is by a stripes I'm healed. That's all you think of. The same is true with so many of these other verses. We're talking about verses. Remember, they did not have verses in Paul's day. Now, he knew passages because he quoted them, so there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that it'd be better if we didn't have any verses like Paul's day and still be able to quote a little bit because somehow you had to find that and know about that portion of that scroll that you were unwinding. We've taught you that before. Somehow you'd have to know a little about that rather than being able to take the shortcut of memorizing a verse and just listing verses and going down the line. Now, I have all of my charismatic verses that apply to this. And the songs that a lot of people sing aren't any better. Hath God said a lot of these songs that are being sung by people? These songs about Jehovah is Lord? I'll tell you what. These are not hath God written songs. These are God hath not written these songs. He has not inspired these songs. I'm really not even speaking so much of those hymns that are embalmed with doubt and unbelief in the system. But so many of these little charismatic tunes, little charismatic phrases, little charismatic tunes, you have to know something about what's being said and compare it with the word of God to find out whether or not it's valid. I remember back in our days, non-charismatic, now I'm speaking of, I think we made reference to this Sunday morning 
to singing do lord do lord now the grown-ups look down with favor upon us little junior high singing that all the time why didn't someone point that out and i dare say that's probably been sung in charismatic circles by the young people for all of them to have fun <coughs> or kumbaya the lord's not going to come by there when you're filled with unregenerate people he's not coming by there or what about that song we are one in the spirit we always sang that, and we always were one in the wrong spirit, the spirit of this world. But, you know, we meant something else by that. You ever sat around campfire and sung that song before? Maybe you're too old or you weren't in an evangelical church or you didn't get to go on religious retreats. Because when you did, then you had fun singing, We are one in the spirit. And I'll tell you what, dear friends, and this will lead up to something else that I want to say now that I'm thinking of it. Whenever you get in these little outings, I'm talking about your little junior high and senior high programs, go on these little religious retreats together, and you're all out in nature taking a walk, and as you're all walking down to the riverbank, you're singing, we are one in the spirit, we are one in the spirit. And you know what happens? You have these emotional feelings that come up in you. I had it happen to me, and you equate that with being converted. Yeah. So many people have gotten right on into Christianity and never been converted to begin with. Mm -hmm. And how did it happen? Well, for me it happened. I got right on into religious activity by having these emotional feelings. And that's all it was, was a feeling that you had. Whenever the young people got together, and you younger people here know what I'm talking about if you've been on religious retreats before, where you have these emotional feelings because all the boys and the girls are together. And you're singing that we are one in the spirit. And you had this feeling that came over you and someone stands up and says, bless great Jehovah, I got religion today. <laughs> I don't know if I said those exact words, but I'm sure I did something like that because you thought that these feelings were to be equated with salvation. Which brings to mind another little song that we used to sing. You remember that little song, Give Me Oil in My Lamp? keep me burning 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 well that wasn't all to it you see because we young people change the words around you ever change the words around and be really cute with that song and sing things like give me wax for my board keep me surfing for the lord as, <laughs> as though people in north mississippi knew anything about surfing we were thousands of miles away from any surfing Hath God written these little tunes that the little young people get together? Or give me grease for my skates and keep me coasting toward those gates. <laughs> or I think what was our favorite one, our favorite unscriptural one. Now, I'm sorry if you've got a Ford or something, but give me gas for my Nova and keep me trucking for Jehovah. <laughs> We'd sit around and sing those little poppy tunes all the time. And you just think of great Jehovah and the Lord, and we're going to be cool with our suntan lotion and surf for the Lord and get the hippies converted and be a beatnik with them while we're out there and have a lot of fun and no one's converted. You see, a lot of this has happened and people got right on into the church, thought they got the baptism because they mumbled something. They didn't get the Holy Spirit. I wonder what the last days will prove about who had the baptism and who didn't have the baptism. People just mumbled a little mumbo-jumbo thing. They had an emotional feeling whenever they were out there walking with the teenage friends at the religious retreat somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. They had a religious feeling and thought, well, this must be salvation. This must be conversion. I know because it happened to me before. And these religious or these emotional feelings in your body or your mind or whatever, it was like one charismatic teacher called certain things what he referred to as body felt salvation <laughs> body felt salvation for young people may just be another term for fornication mm -hmm. because if it's body felt and it feels like you're being saved it's probably fornication and you know what that goes on all the time mm -hmm. in little religious groups because i know firsthand about that so don't tell me i don't know what i'm talking about <laughs> what do you think happens when junior and senior high people get out and, and sing we are one in the spirit have God written all of this nonsense? Or the chief one of them all, and I can still picture one time doing it. If I was an artist, I would draw a picture. But I'm not, so I'm not going to embarrass myself. I could draw a picture of just what the scenery looked like. We were all sitting around 
or I think standing around a campfire roasting marshmallows and hot dogs and singing pass it on pass it on <laughs> which always reminded me of a marijuana party like it's time cool buddy to I know it's just a roach but pass it along anyway pass it on pass it on and so people and that's what I always thought about pass it on this is either a marijuana party or it's a drinking party one or the nut one or the other to be standing around saying pass it on you'd see little girls and boys you know back in your junior high days girls grow fast you know in those days and they're generally about two inches taller than their boyfriend which is always embarrassing but you'd find boys and girls with their blue jeans on the girls always seem to either have you know these athletic jerseys on or for some reason a maternity blouse on I don't know why I don't know why but I don't know to feel more free or comfortable or cool underneath it or whatever and the ones who led the singing always had long straight hair and tight blue jeans and maternity blouse and little tiny wire rimmed gold glasses for some reason that's the way that it was but you know I can remember we'd be out there and we stand around the fire you ever seen young people 12 13 year olds going down the street somewhere the girl's about two inches taller than he is. They got tight blue jeans on, and they've got their hands in one another's back pockets. <laughs> they barely can fit in those pants themselves, <laughs> let alone get your back hand in their pocket. These little queer people, that's queer to do something like that. You see them walking down the middle of the mall, two teeny boppers, you know, 12, 13 years old, with their hands in one another's back pockets. I feel sorry for a couple like that who ever gets caught in a burning house. <laughs> because, you know, whenever you're in a hurry, it's all you can do <laughs> to get your own head out of your own pocket. You'd get turned every which way but loose if you've got your hand in your girlfriend's back pocket. That's always queer. That was always queer to me. But we'd stand around the fire, you know, and you'd put your hand in your girlfriend's back pocket and she'd put her hand in your back pocket and you'd sing, pass it on. <laughs> and then if, if you felt like anything, it's probably love is what it was. It was puppy love is what you felt, not the Holy Spirit or salvation. Then you equated that with salvation. These little queer acting people, and I'm using queer not in the way that it's used nowadays. It means something entirely different. You know what it used to mean back in whenever those days were. You could use queer and not people start thinking of all types of weird things. Like my old sister, I think, my older sister used to call me queer bait whenever I was small. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shouldn't be telling on myself, but it just comes out. <laughs> telling you how I'm using it. <laughs> Now I'm using the word. Well, that really made my girlfriend mad whenever she said that. The, because if I'm a bait for queers, you know what that makes her to be. I only had one. Some of you are slow this evening. It's like delayed action, you know, before you get a response. Well, I don't know how that came out, but that was my nickname. I'm not proud of it at all, so let me tell you that right away. <laughs> Being called queer bait. My girlfriend didn't like that at all whenever she found out about it. Well, anyway, that's the way I'm using the term. You know, weird, strange people, but not weird in the way that people use weird today. Well, still, hath God written. I mean, we were encouraged to participate in these little groups together and sit around or stand around the fire, the stars would be out at night, and you'd be singing all these songs, and God's not ordained all of that nonsense. Yeah. And the various little tunes that are sung there, we're saying, hath God written a lot of these charismatic choruses that people are singing? And that was even for we who were non-charismatic at the time. Hath God written all of that? You know, I brought uh, something I got in the mail today. It looks like really uh, a good catalog. As a matter of fact, they say in the front cover that it's the best one they've ever done. Such and such is Faith Library, a catalog of books and cassettes. And you know, I was reading here on the front that this individual who, according to the front inside, has been in the ministry 40 years, they're now offering his, as well as his son's, 100 books and 300 cassettes. 
You know, I divided that today and found out that is seven cassettes per year. <laughs> you think someone who's been in the ministry 40 years and you're proud of your 300 cassettes that you have available? You know why they only have 300? It's because they teach a message and only the really dynamic ones, the dynamic ones where they taught it in a big auditorium that they think is worth putting on the list so that you can sell, whether it's how to write your own ticket with God or El Shaddai, favorite ones who've been around for years and years and years, which is telling me a lot about yourself and your ministry if those other however many times you preach that year aren't worth being put on cassette to be sold to someone. Then I wonder about these dynamic ones. Well, the front page, one individual, oh, it's in full living color. It must have cost a lot to print it up. Has one, two, three diamond, diamond rings on. He's got one of those, those gold bracelets on. You know, men don't wear bracelets, jewelry like that. That's what a girl would wear. Uh, looks like a gold watch, maybe a Rolex. And, of course, you can't do without his big brown faith glasses right. yeah big brown faith glasses that he has on so I was looking through here to see had God written or said any of these things in here I found one little oh I've heard this many times little tape book offer entitled you ever heard of this before doesn't this sound like charismatic humanism to you how to write your own ticket with God you ever heard that before that always sounded like charismatic humanism to me. And then in a book that deals with the healing of the Christian's body and the atonement and so forth, it's advertised as such. This reprint of a classic book by Dr. Such and Such, a Greek and Hebrew scholar, is a comprehensive <laughs> study of divine healing from the original Bible manuscripts. <laughs> you see, he gave himself away not to be a Greek or a Hebrew scholar or a doctor to say that you've dealt with it from the original Bible manuscripts. Well, I look for things like that, you see. And we're enlightened to these deceptions around here. And people say, you know, that's being too picky or something, pointing out something like that. Well, if he saw a manuscript on, whose, on which the hand of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, Jude, I think that got all of the New Testament authors, I want to see it then. Amen. If their hand laid on it, I'm not going to treasure it or put it in my safety deposit box or something, but I, and I don't even have one, so don't go away wondering what I've got in there. I just use that as an illustration. People will think about everything if you don't tell them everything. But I want to see it original manuscript a lot of people wouldn't know anything about this of course they wouldn't think anything they'd probably just pass over it but if someone thought they'd think original bible manuscripts well you folks have a lot of tapes on that that deals death blows to such stupidity and charismatic nonsense as that Amen. or here's a book and i noticed by the way that all the books or most of them most all of them that i can see have new covers on them the ones that I have from this ministry are years old, and they just had a plain cover. Now they all have lots of fancy color design on the front. And here's one that's changed, the woman question. <clears throat> in full gospel Bible schools, women study the word of God in preparation for service as missionaries, evangelists, and preachers. Is full gospeldom at variance with the scriptures concerning women in ministry? It most certainly is. <laughs> Dr. Such-and-Such's book gives answers from the Word of God to this and other important questions concerning the role of women in the body of Christ. And you know, when I first read that, I couldn't find the answer. And I thought I must have been unspiritual. And so I put it down and picked it up several months later. I still couldn't find it. And you know what? I looked at it today. I couldn't find it today either. <laughs> Or how about this charismatic humanism? How to make the dream that God gave you come true? Well, if he gave it to you, he'll make it come true then. What do you mean? This is this self-realization, dream your way to success nonsense. Yeah, how to make the dream that God gave you come true. You don't find, oh, uh, I don't even want to go into that. That is so ignorant. But I do like the next to last page here because here's where they have their theological works. 
<laughs> you want to guess what a few of them are? Well, World's New Testament. They always use World's New Testament. I don't know why they use World's New Testament. No one's ever heard of World's New Testament. <laughs> I mean, anytime you study anything about Bible translations, I'll guarantee you that's one you'll never come upon. <laughs> and I know I've got several score, about 40 Bible translations and a Hebrew Bible and a Hebrew interlinear and three Greek Bibles and two Hebrew interlinears or Greek interlinears as well as Bibles in other languages. So I know a thing or two about Bible translations. And I have worlds, but... Who knows anything about that? These are their theological Bible study aids. <laughs> Number two, of course, would be Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, so you can find your proof text you're looking for. <laughs> you want to guess what the third one is? W.E. Vines, Expository oh. Dictionary. <laughs> Oh, I just laugh when you turn through this and see these things about how to write your own ticket with God and how to make your dreams come true. And then when they come to Bible study aids and theology, they say get a concordance, get a Bible dictionary, vines to be the best one in the world's New Testament, and you'll be guaranteed you're a biblical theologian. And I think they've got even got some records with Jehovah and so forth at the very end. Well, have God written all that nonsense? I dare say he hasn't. You know, in conclusion, Matthew chapter 4, we see that the devil can and does use Scripture. We're saying, hath God written? Are we saying, someone might ask, that Isaiah 53, 1 to 6 is not valid? No, we're not saying that. Or John 10, 10 is not in the Bible? No, we didn't say that either. But what we are saying is that regardless of whether you found a verse in the Bible or not, Matthew 4 and Luke 4 show me that Satan himself can and does use Scripture. But he generally uses it in one of two ways. He will misapply a verse or he'll use it to the neglect of others, which is exactly what happened with Jesus and his temptation in Matthew 4, specifically, as well as it's related over in Luke chapter 4. So these are valid verses, but my contention is charismatics misapply these, whether we're talking about a Proverbs 6-2 or John 10-10 10, 10, or some of the others that we might have touched upon. They either misapply these or sometimes they apply them right, is 1 Peter 2.24 talking about bodily healing? I think that it is. Amen. But they'll use that to the neglect of all other verses in the Bible. Some others that may teach other things, not to contradict that. But if you use one verse to the, to the neglect of all others, you're going to end up with half or a fifth or a tenth or whatever, or less than that of the theology of the Word of God. That's why my heart is just so excited and so blessed, and I hope yours is too, over all that we are learning and all that we know that we have before us yet to learn. You'd just be amazed at how it can get you really straightened out in so many different areas when you've got a firmer grasp on these things. Because you know what? There's no one in here that I know of that's an exception. Those of us <clears throat> who have come out of, we used to say come out of the system, now who've come out of the charismatic movement, who were not damaged at one time or another with this proof take syndrome, with his healing. What do you think of when you think of charismatic conventions? Prosperity, healing, deliverance, you know, these little things you think of. You wouldn't think of a study in the book of Exodus or something? Oh, be that far from the minister to deal with a passage in the book of Exodus. Why is it every convention I ever went to, every charismatic meeting I went to, was something about these favorite popular charismatic verses? And the vast majority of the Bible was never even touched upon. Amen. Never even touched upon. Right. And I'll tell you why. It's because the ones teaching didn't know anything about the rest of the Bible. Right. But in conclusion, one verse in Psalm chapter 12. My life has to be founded upon the Bible and, and so does yours. The Bible and the clear teachings of the word. This is what Jesus said is the truth, the word of God. I don't want to hear what people want to tell me about someone said that God said to them or they believe. I believe that it's in the Bible or, or my Bible has or this or that or God wrote that or God said that. I'm not too concerned about what all those people's opinions are. 
and any concern that I have is growing lesser as the days go by. Psalm 12 and verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. Oh, thank God for that. His words are pure words, not these perverted words of charismatic teachers who will teach, yes, in one message, yes, it's just by the blood of Jesus, teaching on the blood, the power of the blood. And another message say, no, the blood doesn't redeem man. Well, if the blood doesn't redeem, I doubt it does anything else either. It won't protect or deliver or anything else. If it won't save a man, they'll teach that. In one message they'll say, power, there's power in the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And they'll come right along saying that the blood doesn't redeem, but he'll stay in hell. The words of the Lord are pure words. You see, those are impure words, impure, improper, heretical words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. That's how pure the word is. The word of God. It has none of the dross that charismatic ministers have with the words they say. Their words haven't been purified because their words aren't the words of God. Amen. Hath God said? No, God hath not said what charismatics are saying. Did God send them? No, God didn't send them either. Jeremiah 23, they sent themselves. Amen. They're prophesying a vision, a dream out of their own heart. Has God written what they're telling us that God has written? I don't think so. I know there's this revival in faith message and healing and all this. I know people are saying that. But I'm saying God has not written what they say that he's written. And you say, well, they're giving verses. Well, even the verses that they give that are right, they're using to the neglect of the rest of the word of God. And I don't care if they give you what amounts to be a true teaching of divine healing. And you really become more accustomed to understanding the biblical truth of divine healing. You just really need to know a lot more than just divine healing, though. Faith, prosperity, deliverance, Psalm 91, protection, whatever. You really need to know a lot more than that. Where is it found? It's found wherever you can find the words of the Lord, which is here in the Word of God. Because here we have pure words. They're like silver. You know what silver? Silver is not good until it's been purified. And all of the dross has been purged away. It becomes pure then. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Is this Word of God? Dear friends, we cannot go anymore. In this day and age in which we live, we never have been able to by the words of man. Man's words are not pure words. Man's interpretation of the Bible and then them saying, well, God wrote this doesn't mean anything as far as I'm concerned. We've dealt with a whole variety of things, you know, in the last few months here. Everything from, well, misconceptions over John 10.10 10 to people's false doctrine of the validity of a prophetess for the New Testament era and none of that can be found in the word of god i'm saying their interpretation of these things can't be found in the word of god Amen. and it's not because i've got a couple of verses that say that i want to see the whole new testament i have some verses there's nothing wrong you see somewhere god has to tell us the truth it's going to be found in a verse somewhere the truth has to be there the truth is found in the verses of our bible but I'm just saying people get too much locked into this verse mentality. Where is the verse? Where is the verse? Where is the verse? There's going to be one if it's true somewhere. I mean, if it's not in the Bible, then it's not true. And the Bible is made up of verses. Therefore, it has to be found in the verses of the Bible. But even though I might have a verse or two that says something about this, what does the whole spirit of the scriptures teach? You know, people can, the devil was, Matthew 4, can get deceived with a true verse, with a true verse, but whenever they don't know the whole context of Scripture, they misapply that or they use it to the neglect of others or both at the same time, if, which is exactly what Satan did. He misapplied. The verse doesn't apply to what Jesus was doing at that time. And he also used it to the neglect of others because if he would have remembered, he knew where it was. If he knew Psalm 91, he knew Deuteronomy. If he would have used or remembered Deuteronomy, like Jesus remembered the verse in Deuteronomy, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, then he wouldn't be spouting off at the mouth from Psalm 91. And charismatics are known for doing that. So we don't apologize, dear friends, and I trust you grow more and more accustomed to it when you're part of this church, of not using James 5 every service, 
I'm not referring to Mark 16. You see, we had to do an honest study about that Mark 16 passage. Mm -hmm. And bless God, it just feels so free, and it is free, to be honest about Mark 16. And if it's not valid, it's just not valid. So what? We showed you from the passage the same things are supported other places in the Word of God. Amen. So why be so accustomed and attached to this proof text syndrome of having Mark 16 and you love to just rub that in the face of a non-charismatic and show that non-charismatic. Jesus didn't say these signs are just for apostles. He said to those that believe, and we love to emphasize that, because they say, no, those things only work for apostles or for God's ministers or prophets. And what do we use that passage for? Those that believe. They'll speak in tongues, drink deadly things, cast out demons, lay hands on the sick. That's found in the rest of the Word of God. This comes to mind. I'm just going to mention it. You put a footnote in your notes. I believe that some people have given us an overemphasis to charismatic body ministry. Now, I know it's kind of quiet because you have to think about that. I told someone this yesterday or day before or sometime. And what that has done is encouraged everyone to have their own little private, well, these fanciful notions they get of what God wants them to do or where he's leading or whatever. I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way in which to say it. We're not trying to take any liberties away. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 are in the Bible. But you know as well as I do that, that the average member out there of the charismatic movement He's, he's the type of person who, if you ever contradict him, he'll just tell you, don't tell me anything that you know. I already know what I need to know. And he'll say that in the face of leaders and everybody, that he knows he's independent in himself. And I was telling someone the other day how I really respect, and you have to do it in the right sense of the word, the teachings of people like John Calvin and Martin Luther. They had such a strong emphasis on the fact that God appoints ministry to be over the people. That's just the way he does it. And he said that the keys to entering into the kingdom were given to his ministers, Peter, the other apostles, Amen. as well as all other ministers that follow behind him. And I think that, that although so many people, you know, of course, are not taught anything about charismatic body ministry, you're just taught to be a spectator, come to church, rise and sit on cue, put a dime in the offering, tip the choir if you're really good, and then leave on time and don't bother anyone, just a spectator, not a participator, that again, what have charismatics done? God's made man upright, and they've gone out and sought many inventions. They go overboard the other way and just say, well, it's body ministry. We all are God's ministers. We all should be in ministry. We all should be independent. The Lord speaks to all of us. And what's happened? Confusion in the charismatic movement. No direction, no leadership. So you do with that what you want to. And I don't think we've got any problems here in that area. So you're already practicing that, although you might have never heard me say that before, that I really do feel that some people, the way that I see it anyway, and you think about it some yourself, and I trust you'll see it that way, have overemphasized charismatic body ministry so that everybody's allowed to do whatever they want to. And, and of course, at the same time, they try to threaten and say, you know, don't speak against God's ministers, which really puts people in a bind because you're contradicting yourself in some sense of the word, I feel, to go that far. Well, anyway, we trust that the Lord guides the whole body, but he guides through the word of God, through the teaching of the word, through the leadership, and we'll all be in agreement with it. Praise the Lord. Praise, the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we've got some more, but I think I'll stop there. Hallelujah. It's hard to put a period to this subject is on my heart so much the last few months is getting after these charismatic ministers because until someone tells you these things sometimes you just won't have the boldness to come right out and think them on your own you're tempted to whenever they always try to grab your money from you but it's valid in so many other areas besides just the financial area it just may be we're part of the great apostasy. It's right all around us with the charismatic church. Amen. My, my. 
You'd be sent to the guillotine in a charismatic convention for saying that. But you think of some of the meetings you've been to, the swaying in the breeze, singing we're one in the spirit, pass it on, he is Jehovah, dancing in the aisles, doing a belly flop on the stage, or whatever. You have to wonder. You know, I gave you that illustration. I don't know when that was, but someone reminded me afterwards they knew of the same soul of which I spoke, the one that likes to prophesy and then do a belly flop. And this other individual pointed out, and I remember this, I'd just forgotten it, that his wife liked to do it on top of him then. Yeah, she really would. She'd come up there and prophesy, and then she'd do a belly flop. that all fall out in the spirit on top of one another. That's after jabbering in tongues, you know, between one another for a while and pointing and talking in tongues and then interpreting and then just fall out in the spirit. And then as this other brother pointed out, and I remember the same thing, I just forgot to point it out. They have the little, I don't know what you call them, little towel layers or whatever, that they had all these towels they carried with them whenever the women fell out. They happen to wear dresses when you go to a nice service, you know, that's the only time you wear a dress, but you cover their legs up with the little towels. They had the little men appointed to carry the little towels around. <laughs> I wonder what happened on the day of Pentecost. I'm sure some of them got <laughs> slain the spirit and someone carries little towels around, lay on top of one another. Well, we're back to that good verse in Ecclesiastes. Lo, this only have I found. God hath made man upright, and they've sought many inventions. We're just seeking many inventions, trying to improve on the best that there can be, which is God's way. We're trying to improve on that. <laughs> I mean, speaking in tongues and interpretation and being slain in the Spirit, that's all God's way. But to jabber to one another in tongues and to a belly flop on the stage, you're trying to improve on God's way. And it just works backwards. Again, we can say it's self-defeating. You're not doing anything but, well, I know you're getting a big following because that appeals to charismatics. I've said before that the more ridiculous it is, the more they'll believe it. They'll think that's got to be God or he wouldn't do that. And you don't know that he just likes doing strange things like that anyway. He used to be a professional wrestler, so he's good at doing things like that. I'm not saying this man is or was. I don't know. But time will tell about all this. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Time will tell. Sometimes we get ahead of time and tell you beforehand. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For God is not a man. 